Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast. I am your host, Tom Brady, the director of the Homeland Security Training Institute here at the College of DuPage. And for those of you who listen to us regularly, thank you. And for those of you who may just be joining in for the first time, welcome. Um, On the show, we talk a lot about different issues in Homeland Security related to law enforcement, firefighters, emergency managers, anything to do with Homeland Security on the state, local, and federal level. And today we have a wonderful guest. We have uh, Mary Beth Judy, who's the Senior Deputy Coroner with the DuPage County Coroner's Office. And to tell you a little bit about Mary Beth, she's been working in death investigations with with DuPage County for the past 12 years, where she conducts scene investigations, examines bodies for evidence of disease and trauma, and assists families through the loss of their loved ones. Mary Beth also has a background in funeral directing, autopsy technician, and is currently pursuing the addition of teaching to her work experience. And it's my pleasure to welcome Mary Beth Judy. Hi, Mary Beth. Hi, Tom. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. We're thrilled to have you. Um, We were talking a little bit before the podcast, and you know, I'm just fascinated by your career and what you do. So for my listeners who may not know, can you talk first a little bit about what the coroner's office in DuPage County does? Sure. The coroner's office is uh, county law enforcement, and we concentrate in the um, investigation of death. Um, so anytime somebody dies in DuPage County, it's our office's job to figure out why they died, what happened to them, is there anything traumatic or suspicious going on, is this a natural death, and really just get a feel for, for what's going on and investigate if necessary. So a lot of decisions have to be made when you're working on these investigations. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So Dr. Jorgensen is a good friend of the Homeland Security Training Institute. He's been here at the college many times. Um, he's been a great resource to us um, during the summer when we have our Citizens Public Safety Academy. And uh, so he's been great. But one of the questions I have, Mary Beth, and I wasn't able to ask him this last time I talked to him, was can you explain a little bit about the difference between a coroner and a medical examiner? Sure. The coroner's office and the medical medical examiner's office, first of all, basically do the same thing. We both investigate deaths. We both help the families. Um, we both perform autopsies. Um, the main difference between the two systems is the politics and who's in charge of the office. Um, in the coroner's system, the coroner is a political person, um, common misconception, he does not need to be a doctor. Does not need to be. No. Coroner Jorgensen happens to be. Mm -hmm. He spent his career as a physician um, before retiring from medical practice and coming over to our office. Um, But it is not actually a requirement uh, to hold the office. They run for office every four years, and um, they're elected by the people of the county. Um, In the medical examiner system, um, the chief medical examiner does need to be a physician. And they're not elected. They're appointed by the county board, whatever county it is that they serve, um, usually to a lifetime term, depending on where they're where they're serving. But whether they're an appointed doctor in a medical examiner's office or an elected coroner, they both hire other doctors to do their autopsies, and they both hire investigators to run their investigations. So again, the main main difference between the two systems is is who's in charge of the office. Okay, so the coroner being a doctor is a, is a real plus. A it medical is. doctor, I would think. And also, there's probably not that many coroners that are medical doctors in the state of Illinois. There are not. Uh, no, most of them um, have uh, law enforcement backgrounds um, in some of the smaller communities. They're even the local funeral directors. Um, it really depends on uh, the area where, where the person, or excuse me, where the um, office is. Um, and it's the same thing throughout uh, throughout the entire country. Uh, depending on the population of the area that you're in, um, sometimes coroner medical examiner's offices can be um, combined through counties. Um, some have statewide medical examiner systems. Um, so it really depends on where you are. Okay. So they're all, all different. All different. A lot, them, a lot of them are different, I take it. Mary Beth, I was fascinated by your background. Thank in you. in your, your your work history. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I know you have your master's degree from Lewis University in criminal social justice. Yes, sir. And you began work as a pathology assistant at the DuPage County Coroner's Office. 
and then for a couple of years, and then you left to become a funeral director. Yes, sir. Can you talk to me a little bit about that and how that how that transition happened? Certainly. Um, I, uh, I came out of college with a degree in biology uh, from Benedictine University, and um, I was able to find work. I actually just kind of fell into it um, on accident, um, working as a pathology assistant with the coroner's office. Um, and that was really fascinating to me uh, because At that point, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I had an interest in medicine. um, I had an interest in law enforcement. um, And I didn't really know where that that left me. So uh, winding up at the coroner's office um, and learning the job of a pathology assistant, assisting the doctors, um, really helped clarify it for me because I was able to see so many different areas all of the different areas that were involved in the the coroners and the death investigation system. Um, And I learned about it, and I found out that being a deputy coroner uh, really let me do a little bit of both. I get to do a little bit of medicine uh, with examining bodies and a little bit of police and detective work. So unfortunately, at that point, um, the that position was not a full-time job. Um, so I left and became a funeral director. I went to uh, Warsham College of Mortuary Science up in Wheeling and um, studied for a year, um, became a licensed funeral director, um, which was very interesting, a whole different side mm-hmm. of the um, death industry. Um, but when and I practiced for a couple of years, and then uh, finally they had a full time position open as a deputy with DuPage County, and I was happy to come back. Um, and it's been about twelve years now as an investigator. Wow! So you went to uh, Dade City, Florida, to be a funeral director. Yes, okay. as part of your uh, funeral director training, and in order to become licensed, you have to do. An internship. Okay. Um, generally, they're a year long, depending on which state you're trying to get licensed in. Um, and um, I went, I went to Florida, uh, just for a different experience. I grew up in the Chicago land area, mm-hmm. never lived anywhere else. Um, so it seemed kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, uh, Dade City is a small town near Tampa, and it was it was very nice. It was a good experience. It sounds like it was a great experience. Mm-hmm. So, Mary Beth, let's talk a little bit about the job that you do now at the. DuPage County Coroner's Office. You're one of the senior deputy coroners. Yes, sir. Can you tell our listeners about your job and what that involves? Is you're a death investigator? Is that just part of the job, or is that something separate? No, uh, a deputy coroner is a death investigator. Um, so when I uh, come on to shift, um, I would expect to receive uh, phone calls or pages from emergency personnel that's with uh, with a dead body. Um, they give us a call. They let us know a little bit about what's going on. Um, some general basic and in- scene invest excuse me scene information and. Um, uh, information about the deceased, um, we would get a phone call or page uh, from any emergency personnel that's with a dead body, uh, whether that was police officers, paramedics, doctors, nurses, um, anybody who's with a dead body, they give us a call uh, because they're required to do so by law. They're required to report any death. Mm-hmm. Um, so they'll let us know a little bit about this person, um, who they are, um, where they are, uh, if they have any medical information or medical history, if they have a doctor, and we'll take that information and uh, dis- make a decision about how much investigation actually needs to take place. Um, now, obviously, if there's trauma, um, homicide, suicide, drugs or alcohol, uh, motor vehicle crashes, anything unnatural, um, that uh, sends us into a much more in-de- uh, in-depth investigation. Right. Um and then in uh, other cases where perhaps the person has a medical history, um, maybe they're under hospice care, um, and there's nothing traumatic or suspicious going on, um, we wouldn't need to delve into that uh, quite so deeply. So are you, the as, as one of the senior deputy coroners um, going out on a death investigation, are you the, the, the authority in charge of that death scene? Yes. Okay. Uh, legally, uh, any time that there is a dead body, present, the coroner's office has full control over that scene. Um, Now, of course, we work very closely with the police departments, um, and we don't normally choose to um, exercise that full control over the scene. Um, We work very closely um, because we each have our different investigations that need 
need to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was being careful not to trample um, trample over each other. Um, we work closely, but legally, to answer your question, yes, we are the okay. authority in charge of the scene. Okay. Well, I'm glad you clarified that because I, 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 I assume that they were, but you know, of course, I don't want to assume anything because I don't know. You know, sure. um, the uh, I think one time Dr. Jorgensen had mentioned, and and, and I, I have a kind of a follow up question to what you talked about in the death investigation, that only the coroner can declare when a body can be moved. Is that is that accurate? Yes. So that's... tell tell me a little bit about that, in terms of uh, you know how that works when there is other people investigating and doing things around it. So what we what we do is we ask. Um, let's just say that the police or the other aid, one of the police departments, one of the other agencies involved. Um, all we ask is that once the person is declared deceased, um, that they leave the body alone. Um, they don't touch the body. They don't move the body, um, unless, of course, it's to make the scene safe for for everybody. Um, but we we do ask that they not move the body um, without our permission. And the reason for that is is because in order to perform a, a thorough death investigation, a lot of times the initial positioning of the body is very important. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can often tell us a lot about what may have happened to the person. Um, because it tells us, it could tell us what they were doing before they died. Now, does it look like they just fell out of a chair? Um, does it look like they um, were sitting on the bed and collapsed backwards? Um, things like that would be very difficult to tell um, if the body's already been moved. Right. In terms of the, the talking about the day in the life of a death investigator, I understand that it's 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 Pretty, pretty long shifts, 12-hour shifts? Is, we, that, is that generally how, how long it is? Uh, we do. Our office works rotating 12-hour shifts. Okay. Um, I, I believe a lot of the police departments in the area are on mm-hmm. something something similar. Right. right. That's that's true. Mm-hmm. So in terms of what you do on the, on, the, uh, on the scene, you know, you're dealing with a lot of different people. You know, you're dealing with, uh, you know, p- police, possibly firefighters. You're dealing with family as well. Do you deal with family or is there, or, or is there someone that would d- deal with the family uh, other than yourself? No, th- dealing with the families is a big part of what it is that we do. Um, and I'll I'll say um, that it's often um, the most important and the most difficult thing that we do, Um, which sounds a little bit silly to some people. Um, They say, you know, gosh, dealing with the the deceased people isn't hard, isn't the hard part. And it's really not. It's dealing with the live people um, because they're the ones with um, the emotions, the grief. um, They're upset. They're screaming. They um, are so stoic. You wouldn't think they cared. You really just don't have any idea how somebody's going to react when they're in such a state of shock and grief. Mm -hmm. Um, So trying to explain to them what it is that we're doing, um, get our message across to them and the information that they need, and trying to obtain the information uh, that we need uh, to complete the investigation can be very difficult when somebody's in such an uh, excited and upset state. I can only imagine how difficult that must be. And after doing your job for 12 years, um, what kind of an impact does that have on, on you? I mean, how do how do you even deal with that? Because it's it's got to be on a regular basis. You're dealing with this. It is on a regular basis, and it's something that um, you through the years and through doing it over and over. It's something that you just you learn to to handle, and you learn to um, separate yourself from it and not take it personally and um, leave it at work. And it's uh, it's it's difficult. It's not necessarily uh, something that everybody can do, um, but it's very very necessary uh, for somebody in our our position. I would think in that position you have to be a really special person to to be able to to do that because you know obviously you have empathy for the family members and you're you're dealing with them in a very difficult situation for them. And but you're also conducting an investigation at the same time. So I can only imagine how how tough that may be. Um, if you're at a death scene, Mary Beth, what would lead to further investigation? You know, further, like you come to a death scene and, and, and you see it for the first time. What are some of the things that you would look for that may may relate to having 
conduct a further investigation? There's different um, changes that the body goes through. Um, obviously, if we were to arrive and we were to find drugs or um, excessive amounts of alcohol or weapons, um, but then there are other things that might not be uh, quite so obvious to someone uh, who's not trained in death investigation, um, perhaps bruising. Uh, to the body. Um, sometimes um, skin changes that, let's say, elderly people go through as a natural process um, can mimic bruising um, and can conf- uh, can be a little bit confusing. Um, sometimes um, people will end up with a change um, going on where they begin to foam at the mouth. Um, and that's, that's not normal. Um, that's something that we see that's very indicative of either a drowning or a drug overdose. Um, But assuming the person is sitting in the middle of their living room, we would go ahead and assume it's not drowning. Um, And uh, we would automatically begin to suspect that maybe this isn't a natural uh, clear-cut case. Maybe there was drugs involved. Um, And that that, uh, foaming at the mouth happens with both illegal drugs and uh, medications. Oh, so prescription regular prescription medication. drugs will cause that as well? Um, in an overdose, yes. Okay. So I was going to ask you that the term, and I was reading your, your, your PowerPoint that you do when you do a lot of instruction, yes. foam cone. Foam cone. Is that the, the term for that? That's the term for that. Um, and, it, and it's just exactly what it sounds like. The foam will start coming out of the mouth and form uh, like a cone shape, um, often several a- hours after the person is, has been deceased. Okay. So that's something you look for. Obviously, that gives you a clue as to what may have happened. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting because you know you're 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 working back. It's like it's like you're working backwards in an investigation. You know, you have you have the deceased there, and then you're working to try to go back in time to see what might have happened to this person. Mm-hmm. And that's got to be that's got to be challenging. Have you ever been on a, a a scene where it just was extremely difficult to determine that? I have. Um, uh, luckily, it doesn't happen very often, uh, but there have been cases where um, you go out to the scene, you gather all of your information, um, you examine the body, and um, and you go, gosh, I really just don't know what happened here. Um, and uh, then obviously we would bring the body uh, back for an autopsy, um, at which point our doctor would either find the cause of death um, directly um, or toxicology would be ordered um, so that we would be able to see if there was any drugs or alcohol in a person's system. Um, and quite often in a situation like that, that's where we would end up finding the cause of death. Okay. And you mentioned autopsy. Now, is the coroner the only one that does an autopsy, or are there other doctors that also do autopsies? The coroner himself actually does not do autopsies. Um, We have, uh, at DuPage County, we have a full-time forensic pathologist, um, Dr. Hillary McElligot, um, and she does uh, the majority of our our autopsies. Um, She's specially trained in forensics, um, and she does a really great job. Oh wow! Well, it's good to have a resource like that Absolutely. to be able to, to, to work with you. Um, so, a couple of things you mentioned foam cone, and as I was going through some of the material and preparing to speak with you today, I had to ask you uh, gloving. So, <laughs> I you know I, I was again, I'm just going through the presentation and I'm seeing things that I I, I never knew about. That was fascinating to me. Would you mind talking about that? Sure. What that is gloving. Um, so gloving is um, a, a phenomenon um, with the, when a body begins to decompose. Um, and when a body begins to decompose, um, all of the tissues that uh, once held the person's skin on um, start to start to break down all that connective tissue. Um, and it gets to a stage where the skin starts to slide off. Um, and it's uh, called skin slippage. Um, and when it happens on the hands and on the feet, um, there is a stage where you can uh, pull the skin directly off of the hand, um, and it comes off just like a glove. Um, that's really gross, um, but the cool part about it is, um, in a body that's in that kind, of, that stage of decomposition, um, is not easily identifiable. You couldn't just look at the person's mm-hmm. face and say, "I know that person," uh, because they're going through so many changes. Um, so in those situations, uh, identification becomes difficult. Um, so getting uh, tying that back to the gloving, um, the skin that comes off of that hand um, has a full set of fingerprints. 
on it. Um, so in a dramatic situation, uh, we could pull that skin off, um, put the fingertips over our own gloved hands. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, actually, my partner's, that would be a job for him, yeah, I think. That would partner be partner job. support. Yeah, um, and he could um, uh, roll a full set of fingerprints um, okay. with that. That's fascinating to mm-hmm. me. I, you know, I, Things I never knew. You know? I mean, <laughs> I'm, re- I'm reading through your, your, your work here, and I was like, wow, i gotta, I got to ask Mary Beth about that. Mary Beth, I was looking through your bio, and I know that you're getting much more involved in teaching. Yes. So can you tell me a little bit about your interest in teaching and your passion for it, and, and what things you are teaching? Sure. Um, I was lucky enough um, to start uh, doing a little bit of teaching um, with the coroner's office. Um, Not wasn't formal teaching by any means, um, but we would have uh, school groups that would come through uh, the coroner's office uh, wanting to learn a little bit about um, what it is that we did. Um, A lot of them would be criminal justice uh, related, um, and they would go on tours throughout the, the entire county with one stop being at the coroner's office. Um, And I was able to um, take on that position of speaking to those those groups. Um, Once I was given that responsibility, um, the program kind of took off. Um, We now have over 50 different schools, um, both um, high school and colleges, uh, that come through our office, um, and also community groups, um, that come through our office to learn about what it is that the coroner's office does. People have uh, found an interest in learning about uh, careers with the coroner's office um, because I find through talking with the students, especially the high school and college students, um, that they never knew that this career path existed, um, which is not unlike I was Mm -hmm. when when I first started. I had general interests, but I didn't know that this is where I could go with it um, and make a career out of it. Um, So I have found that a lot of students that I talk to, um, I I explain to them the job and it kind of clicks as something that they they have really had interest in. Um, So since I've been doing that, and I've been doing that uh, probably about 11, 10, 11 years now, um, working with the different schools, um, and it's just been fascinating. I've met so many different students, and it's really kind of empowered me and energized me to um, keep sharing it Mm -hmm. and to to keep talking to students about what their possibilities are, um, you know, not only with the coroner's office, but um, in death investigation and in law enforcement. Um, I had a question that came to my mind when you were talking about your career. Um, Overall, 12 years you've been doing this now. How many death investigations have you been to? Oh, gosh, I couldn't. You know what? I I really couldn't say. Um, Thousands. 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 Um, You know, I don't have an exact number for you, but yeah. I'm just curious, you know, because you've been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if is it in a week, like what would be the number of death investigations you might go in a week to? You know, and we get asked that question a lot. And the answer is it really depends. Um, which is not a good answer, but it, mm-hmm. it's the true answer um, because you really just cannot predict um, when people are going to die. Right. Um, my partner and I are currently work uh, the night shift, um, so I've been working an overnight shift for um, probably about eight, uh, eight to ten years now. Um, and um, some people would think that the night shift is is busier. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it really, it's a toss-up. Yeah. It really it really depends. We have evenings where um, we don't take many calls at all. Um, and then we have evenings where we're hopping around the county in, in all different directions. Yeah. Um, so it, it really it really does depend. I think that the, the fewest calls that I've taken in a shift is uh, maybe two or three. Um, and then the most calls that I've taken, I'd say probably 16 to 20. Wow. That's a busy shift. It's a busy shift. Yeah, I guess yeah. There's no rhyme or reason in terms of when this would, these would happen. So, like right. you said, it's kind of hard to pinpoint them. Mm-hmm. But yeah, obviously, you've had a you've had a lengthy career in it. Um, I certainly tip my hat to you and what you do. I can okay. see just by talking to you that you have such a passion for it. You know, and it's great. What are your What are your career goals? What are you What are you looking for to to achieve in the future? Do you have goals? Um, uh, of course. I, um, I would like to um, stay with the coroner's office. Um, I would like to move up eventually if the, if the opportunity arose. Um, and uh, I would also, on top of that, like to pursue uh, the teaching at the, at the college level. 
Um, so those those are my goals for right now, and, and I've been I've been working towards those. Um, ho- hopefully, achieving them sometime in the near future. So, Mary Beth, I I have to ask. I'm curious. Um, you've been doing this for 12 years. Is there one death investigation that stands out more than others to you over that period of time? Uh, there's one investigation um, that I I recall it all the time, and um, it's one of actually Cor- Coroner Jorgensen's um, favorite investigations. Um, we had a case um, where um, a 50 50- uh, or so year old gentleman um, died in his in a home that he was staying at uh, with some friends and um, nobody really knew why um, everybody thought maybe he was taking drugs or um, maybe there was something suspicious going on um, it was but it was very difficult because there really wasn't any evidence pointing us in any any one direction um, his family was saying that he had uh, medical problems um, his doctors were saying he didn't have medical problems um, so it was really a whole lot of uh, conflicting information um, during the scene investigation um, we just happened to uh, look at his computer um, and his last uh, Google searches um, were, how do you kill yourself with insulin? Oh. Um, which um, is a type of case that I've never had before. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, it's something that had we not looked at that computer and really examined that scene as, as much as we could, um, it's not even something we would have been able to detect on um, toxicology through our normal toxicology panel. Yeah. Um, so had we not kind of gotten lucky and gone that extra step, um, we would have we would have missed it, and we wouldn't have had any idea how that how that gentleman died. Well, it, it, that really illustrates just how important it is the investigative part of what you do, because like you said, you you, you found that, and obviously it led you to the result of how, how this person passed away. But that's why these are so interesting to me because. My career was in was in the investigation side, so I'm, I'm familiar with that. But you kind of combine two different worlds together to really to really tie it together. So that that's that's incredible that you're able to determine that. It really is. Thank you. It's a really interesting story. Well, Mary Beth, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast today. Thank it's you. been a pleasure talking to you. I certainly appreciate what you do, and I think that you have a lot of experience that will relate well into your teaching as you as you move forward because you have a lot of good experience and you have a lot of great skills so thank you for your time today and it was a pleasure having you on the show thank you tom i really appreciate you guys having me thank you so that's it for today please join us for further episodes of the homeland security training institute podcast we have other programs scheduled coming up that i think you'll find to be really interesting So until then, take care and we'll talk to you later.